Okay, so in this chapter, we were doing very working with discrete random variables. And these are the problems. It's, I think, 14 of them, but I only chose seven. So first is, um, so let me, okay. exercise two. Exercise two. Two dice are toast. And then let x be the x be the absolute difference in the number of dots facing up. So I would put a note such random variable. Um, and then in in this kind of matrix, I model in in this column the the possible values from one dice. And, and in this row, the possible values for the other dice. And now in the actual entries of the table, I'm simply computing the, the absolute difference between such, such values. So this would be the possible outcomes. Now to calculate the, the PMF of this uh, random variable, it will simply be a case of, of counting the occurrence, for example, px of zero, that, that, that is that the absolute differences between the, the values obtained with the dice, uh, that such difference is zero. We can see that that happens in these cases where the value is the same between those dice. One, the event one, one, the event two comma two, three comma three and such. So the, all of these have the same probability. We're, we're, referring, we're assuming fair dice. So it's really, in this sum, it just a uh, repeated sum. Uh, six times the value one over six squared, because there are 36 possible outcomes. Right. Okay, now similarly for the PMF evaluated at one, we simply count how many times it occurred, and then we can divide by 36. So I got 10 over 36. And similarly for the other cases, right? So in the end, the, the PMF of 10 is that for these states, uh, these are their respective probabilities. Well, divided by 36. Now, I think they ask us to plot it. So we'll, we'll simply write that, right? The states, then the PMF, uh, here is a graph. Now the second part is to find a probability that that such random variable is less or equal to two. And because it is a discrete random variable, we simply have to evaluate it uh, starting from its lowest value, in this case is zero, and then um, until, until we reach this value two this upper bound. In this case, it states that satisfy the, those, that satisfies that relationship. Uh, those are only zero, the state one and the state two. So we add in their probability, we get that the probability that the absolute differences, difference obtained is less or equal to two is just two thirds. And now lastly, they, they accept they ask us to compute the expected value and the variance of this random variable. So we can do it directly VR. We sum the state multiplied by its probability, and then we can use a formula for, for the variance uh, using the expected value of, well, of the random variable and the expected value of the squared of such random variable. I think it's over here. Yes, yes. Uh, and well, these are the values that I got. Has it all match? Did you get to do the exercises as well? Yes. Yeah, I got the same. Okay. Same answers that you did. I just had to scroll to me to respond because I had to scroll to that section of my workbook, but yeah. 
Now the next exercise, exercise five, uh, well, it's a right, a modem transmit a two plus voltage signal into a channel. And then this channel adds to the signal a noise term with possible, no, with noise term, yes, with possible value zero, minus one, minus two, or minus three. And the respective probabilities are, well, it comes over here. So <laughs> we use a random variable y to, to describe the output of this channel. And they ask us to find the, the PMF. So the output would be simply the input that is plus two and then plus the noise. And the noise would be these values. So we can label Y as two plus X, where X is the noise. Um, now for X, they already gave us, gave us their PMF. It's this set of probabilities for this set of states. So now, because to x, the random variable, we're simply adding two. Uh, let's say, let's call it a deterministic value. Then the PMF of y, uh, well, at least its histogram looks like almost exactly like the histogram of x. Like it's almost like they share the PMFs. The difference is mainly in the, in the states. In this case, simply the states have being added in two volts. So this is the state for X, the probabilities, and now for Y, we add two to such value, but the probabilities stay the same. So this would be the PMF. Now they ask us to compute what's the probability that the channel's output is equal to the input of the channel. Okay, well, there is only a difference between the output and the input. If there was some non-zero noise in the, in the, no, in the case, if there was, if there was a non-zero noise, so the probability that they are equal, it, ha it, has, it happens only in the case noise equals zero. So it could be, what's the probability that X, there is a noise equals zero, and they, they tell us that it is for 10. Uh, basically, here is uh, another way to do it, but it's really the same. Now, they ask us, what's the probability that the channel's output is positive? So that is that y is positive. Uh, we can do that directly with the PMF. So which are the states for which y is positive? And those are 2, 1, and minus 1. So when they are different states, so to, to get that probability of y positive, we simply have to add the individual probabilities for each of these states. Uh, to, uh, point four and uh, point three. Now, I think I said that minus one is positive. No, yeah, I messed up. Okay, now, uh, there was more. And uh, they, they asked us, what is, find the expected value uh, variance of y. Well, it's really the same, right? We define the states, the PMF, and we can do it, so we calculate it via the, the, the known formulas. But at least I found this a little bit interesting because uh, we saw that for the Poisson distribution, the, the expected value and the, and the, I think it was a variance of, of the standard deviation, but those those were the same the same value. It was also the same value as the parameter for the Poisson distribution, but we see over here an example where you can have the the same the same value for the expectancy and for the well for the standard deviation, and and still it's not a Poisson distribution. No, for the following exercise, it says on a given day. Your golf score takes values from numbers one to 10. Well, they actually meant integers. Integers from one to 10, with equal probability of getting each one. Assume that you play golf for three days, and assume that your three performances are independent. Let x1, x2, and x3 be the scores that you get, and x be the minimum of these three numbers, then compute the following. First, 
Uh, well, th this first type name isn't really related, uh, at least at first sight, it's not really related to the, to the actual problem. They simply ask, ask us that for any discrete random variable x, it's, it's now a different x from which was discussed before. And for this arbitrary discrete random variable, they show that this equality holds. So it's really very similar to the one that we saw where you consider x, uh, how do you write this? Something like this. Something like probability that some values between that range as uh, differences of these probabilities. So kind, of, kind of like that, but for uh, discrete random variables. Okay, so the proof, well, I think that there is a little problem with this item. Maybe you can correct me. Uh, but for example, uh, as I try to do it, we can see uh, right, uh, an arbitrary discrete random variable x. So we need to prove this for any real k. And then we can, know, we can take note of the fact that these difference of sets, or in particular of events, also it, it coincides with this expression. That is, uh, the values x greater than k minus one, but that are not greater than k, we can write this expression via this. The x values that are greater than k minus one, but less or equal to k. So because those events or sets are equal, well, and, and they are events, so they are measurable, we can calculate their probability. And we will get that the probability of this event, uh, it's equal to the probability that x is greater than k minus one, minus the probability that k that x is greater than k. And that's it, that is exactly what they, at least the, the right part of what they are, they are asking us to compute. But now, I think there isn't really quite certainty, at least with the information that we have that this event over here, let me write it, that this event is actually the same as the event. Uh, well, it must be though, right? Because there's, these are discrete, right? So there's only one K which is satisfies that, right? There's only one k that is greater than k minus one and less than or equal to k, and that is just k, right? Well, it depends because for k, we, we are not necessarily k. talking about the index that we are doing for the possible states, but for the actual states. So oh, I think that was like a su assume that the k, the very random variable in this case was over integers, but you're right. I don't think that was stated that way. Yeah, because they, they actually mentioned like a new X, not the X over here. Any discrete random variable. Yeah. Well, I guess it's still true, right? I mean, if there was no, if there was no, uh, if, if K was not, if P of K could be zero, right? P sub X of K could be zero, which is fine, right? It's still true, right? I mean, you kind of, you're kind of extending the step, but yeah, it's a discrete random variable. So it takes on, you know, any discrete number, but the probability that it takes on, let's say five could be zero. So it's not actually in the possible outcomes, but it's still a true statement in that sense. Mm -hmm. I, I'm just, I'm flying, I'm just, you know, winging it here, but that's kind of what I'm thinking out loud. <laughs> mm -hmm. Because it's the same thing when they do cumulative sums, right? They do the cumulative probability. They don't worry about the fact that some of them might be zero, right? Mm -hmm. Am I just misunderstanding something about discrete random variables? Let me check. I, I don't really, uh, mention this doubt about the fact that the probability can be zero, but only if this this set, this event, coincides with this, because not, not necessarily the discrete random variable has integer values. It could be like, it, it is getting mapped to the to the real numbers, but yeah. it could do something like like this, right? Only, only pick 
the midpoints. So like uh, getting map to the rationals, but not the integers. No, no, these are discrete. They have to be wrapped. They have to be integers. We're not doing continuous, right? These are, it says discrete random variable and discrete random variable in this chapter is defined as one that takes values on. No, you're right. It could be rational, but it has to be, but there's no, um, I'm sorry. They, they could be other arbitrary numbers, not just integers, but no, I think you're right. You're no, I think you're right. I'm wrong because it seems like they are, they are assuming here that the K's are, are, um, are integers the way they stated yes. it. You have yeah, to go to to solve it um, via that assumption as well. Yeah, I think you're right. They don't say that though, right? What is the discrete random variable? Let me just check, make sure. I, I thought that uh, that the discrete part of the definition only stood for the fact that there are a a countable numbers. amount of states. Yeah. Let's just check here. Where is that in the book? even define discrete <laughs> I think it's just worth just taking a second to make sure we know what we're talking about discrete yeah because he does when he does the chapter of the section on cumulative distribution functions he seems to assume this integer nature of it otherwise the sums he does don't make oh no he doesn't because the indexes, like you said, what the heck? Honestly, I can't find the definition of discrete random variable. He talks about random variable. Maybe it's just a sloppy notation. He really does mean the you know index, the index there, or the integer by there. But you're right; it only works in those cases. Uh, well, at least uh, assuming the. Uh, uh, Tell you the truth, it didn't even. I didn't even phase me when I looked through that problem. Like, ah, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, it has to be that case, right? Just the same thing as the. You know, summing the CDF, right? So, yeah, if I have to simply assume it, I, I don't want to look for the definition right now. Yeah, it's fine. That's, yeah, I'm with okay. you. So, getting back to the, the size. If you look, is... but again, like if you look at um, just one little last thing, if you look at page 30, 22, sorry, page 22, he talks about, you know, it's basically the same formula he gives there um, now written in terms of the cumulative distribution function, which is basically the same thing. That's the way it should have been written, right? And which page? Page 22. Oh, John's here. <laughs> yeah, Hello. I was actually on before I just was listening in my car. Oh, I'm sorry. It's page 22 is, um, I'm looking, I'm not, I'm not in the, um, it turns out they repaged them when you look at it on the website by chapter. So I'm actually not sure oh. what page is, but it's section 3.3.3 .3 converting between PMF and CDF. He says, oh, if, if the sample space of random variable contains integers, then the PMF can be defined. And then it uses K in the way that he has then there, uh, he has in that problem. So I think it is just an abuse of notation there, or maybe the, there's an underlying assumption that he meant any discrete, uh, random variable on the integers for the sample space of the integers because otherwise that problem you're right that's an issue i didn't even notice that you just so used to thinking about integers that <laughs> it didn't even occur to me so i think you're okay with what you wrote there in my view okay so you just you just made it more precise because you said if the states of x are energy value then this holds and i think that is true okay. and, and, Good, exactly, exactly parallels what he wrote in Theorem 3.3. .3. So, um, yeah, very good catch. Yeah, I, I am still not sure what happens in this case, uh, because as I was looking for random variables 
uh, which are which have states that are rational numbers. <clears throat> there were some very weird contract constructions, so yeah, like, they don't seem to be so easy it's to not, work with. Like, I don't think it's supposed to be a hard problem. So I think that, you know it's just one of those things where it's just an underlying assumption he forgot to make explicit. Okay. In my my opinion. So, well, with this assumption, uh, well, the, the event, this coincides with this one over here. Well, let, let me tell you something. Um, okay. So now those events do coincide, so we can simply, so, so we get the formula. Now, they ask us, what is it? Now, now for the actual uh, variables oh, that we're discussing the exercise, uh, they ask us, what is the probability that uh, X1 is greater, is greater than K? And uh, I remember X1 were the scores that you get. So value between, sorry, integer values between one and 10. And in that case, uh, X1 had a uniform distribution over the integers one to 10. So really the, the PMF, uh, it's unique value. It, it's only one over the total, right? So it's one over 10. And now simply to calculate this, this actual probability, we can do it, well, uh, we have two cases. First, we, so we start with a K with a possible state. If X1 is greater than K, then this event is the same as considering the states k plus one and such until then. Uh, but that is in the case that k is not 10. Because if k is 10, then this, uh, I want to use a laser, but I don't know how to activate. Okay, so if, if k is, is 10, then this whole event, like- We there can, is we can see your mouse, we can see your mouse, so. That works okay. like a laser. So if, if K is 10, that there is no state greater than 10, so the event becomes empty. So its probability is also empty, uh, as it is said here in blue. But, but for the other cases, K is smaller than 10, then we can simply, so th th this is event, so we can simply add up the probabilities. And it's a uniform distribution, so simply we add so we count how many elements are in this set um, because it's consecutive numbers or consecutive integers it's simply the the greatest minus the smallest and then you add one so we get uh, this one such probability is 10 minus k uh, everything divided by 10. now they say use a to determine the PMF for X, that is for the minimum of those three random variables. Uh, so in this case, we again have that the possible states for X, that is for the minimum, it's going to be also an integer between one and 10, because it's simply a mi the minimum, so it's an actual value or of all the possible values or states of these variables x1, x2, of, of these random variables x1, x2, and such. So this is a possible states of x. So we pick one of those numbers, and as we calculate this probability, we get that, for example, in this event, x greater than k, that is that the minimum of the values obtained via these random variables is greater than k. Such event is actually the same as the, the event that each one of these random variables is greater than k. Uh, and one can easily prove it. One can assume, for example, this minimum is greater than k, then one gets, for example, something like this one. k is smaller than the minimum. Well, no, sorry, between x1, x2, and x3. But such minimum, by definition, is smaller than x1, so x1 is greater than k, and it's also smaller or equal to x2. Uh, and, and such a, how do you say? And such a, 
uh, an auto profit equivalence, we can go the other way. So we assume that x1 greater than k, x2 as well, uh, similarly for x3. And now because the minimum of these three random variables is going to be one of these, but all of them are greater than k. So the minimum is also greater than k. So it's really the same event. Now, now, with that in mind, we can use a fact. Well, it was mentioned in the text that these three random variables are independent. So this event with, with intersections can be uh, broken into a product, of the product of the probabilities of the individual events. But again, the probabilities for it, for example, the probability that x1 is greater than k is the same as the probability that x2 are greater than k. And similarly for x3, because they, are, they have the same distribution and, and the same states. So we can denote as value at, as p, and we are getting p gift via chopping up this uh, probability of an intersection of events. Now, well, we started with this. So now we have the same is this value. So we can take the complement. It gets subtracted one and changes a sign. So this is what we wanted, I think. And we want the actual PMF. But now we can use a formula that they gave us in part A. That is, or maybe in the text, that is this thing over here. So we simply replace, uh, taking into consideration that this x random variable is taking uh, random, sorry, interior states. Simply replace into the formula and we get now that the PMF of such minimum is this thing. I think it can be simplified a little bit more, this expression, but I don't know, I don't want to just. Now, the last part of this exercise is actually an interesting question. It says, what is the average score improvement if you play just one day compared with playing for three days and taking the minimum? So in this first case, it's the average for X1, you play one day. And in this second case, is the average for X, the minimum of the, the score of the three days. So we can, well, like, once again, calculate it via R. These are the states for both of the random variables, one to 10. The PMF for X1 was, well, it was unique because it's a uniform distribution, but the PMF for X is, a, as we calculate it, right? We have K, that is the possible states, and then in the place is formula, is probability. And we simply calculate the expected values, and the interesting conclusion is that it's actually greater than expectancy if you only consider your score for one day uh, compared to if you consider your minimum score over three days. So, well, I don't know what to, to conclude in real life on that. Maybe one gets. No, I don't know. I was trying to take a, to make a philosoph philosophical completion, conclusion from that, but I don't know. Maybe it's quite a stretch. Uh, now, the exercise nine, it's a little more, more computationally, no, well, not computationally, like, we have to write more math, that's the main point. They first, they mentioned we have a random variable with Poisson distribution parameter lambda and compute the expectancy of these transformation effects. It's the same as this. So, when you play the, a function to a random variable, we still consider the same PMF, in this case, the same PMF for X. Uh, what we change in the expectancy formula is simply the value. In this case, it's taking one over X plus one. So we write one over the possible states plus one. And the possible states are, are all non-negative integers. So it's really a matter of working with this series. We can 
take it up to this point. Uh, and then use a factor. We know that the Poisson distribution has an expectancy of lambda, but also that such expectancy uh, coincides with this definition, right? So this sum, um, we can rewrite this sum um, to look something like the sum that we had previously. We can discard the case k equals zero because the whole thing over here dies, well, nullifies. And simply playing, playing around with such sum, you can give it the form of the sum that we had in the previous slide. This, this one. Now, we had right that this was the expected uh, value of the Poisson of the, of the expected value of the random variable with Poisson distribution, so it was lambda. So we simply compare and we can get that uh, this expected value is this thing over here. Now for it, item B, and this one is actually interesting. And this one a more formal point of view. I, I, I am going to use something. I, I don't know how to prove like formally, but it will be interesting to discuss maybe. So we have now two random distributions. One is uh, with Bernoulli parameter P and the other one Bernoulli parameter Q, but they are also independent. So they ask us to compute the expectancy of this value. We can simply expand this sum, uh, well, this, uh, this value, we get this sum. Uh, and the interesting part is that if you want, for example, if you have two, uh, what do I write? Okay. If you have two random variables, x and y, uh, arbitrary, again, that they are independent, and you have some transformation g that you can apply to x, some function that you can apply to x, and some another function that you can apply to y. Uh, how can you make sure that these new random variables are also independent? Uh, from what I looked up, well, it's I think it's not an if and only if relationship, but at least if j, sorry, j, g, I don't know, I think it's g, if g and f are measurable, then this independence is guaranteed. At least for our case, we don't need to check for measurability of these functions uh, because we can simply use continuity because every continuous function is measurable. In this case, the transformations that we are applying uh, to, to x and y are simply taking a square. Uh, well, taking a square is a continuous function, so it's measurable. So we still uh, are preserving the independence, for example, for here in with x square and y, and the independence of x and y squared, because they appear in these terms. So now we simply apply the linearity of the expectancy. So the expectancy of this sum is a sum of the expectancies. Um, for example, when we take the expectancy of this whole thing, well, three is a constant, so it gets out. But now the expectancy of x squared and y, uh, sorry, touch product, it's the product of the expectancies now because we have verified that they are independent. So it's really very similar to that, to when we saw probability of independent events, that the probability would multiply it. Uh, and simply we are doing that, uh, and also noticing that the moments for the Bernoulli distribution, they are always, that's the parameter because the states of the Bernoulli were only one and zero, right? So for zero, the probability doesn't matter, it's, it vanishes, but for one, and this transformation, LA exponent to K, it really has nothing to it. So we still get the PMF or evaluated at one, that by definition is a parameter. Well, and similarly for Y, because it also has a Bernoulli distribution, and we, we well, we use those values into <coughs> this sum that we got, and the final answer, well, I think, 
is this? Is there a match? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I got the same answer as this too, but I didn't do it that way because I, I mean, I thought about doing it that way, but I'm like, hey, we haven't really introduced this concept of uh, independent random variables and the fact that the expectation value of the multiplication is just the multiplication of the expectation values, if you will. Um, I think in chapter five, they do this. So I said, um, you know what, I'm just going to just do the brute force. So I just wrote out the four possibilities that have, in, you know, P, one, PQ, uh, one minus P, one minus Q, P, one minus Q, one minus P, you know what I'm saying? Just wrote up the four possibilities and did it that way. I got the same answer, but I looked at the video solution and they did it your way where they used the, the, the that fact that the you could take the expectation value of the product of two independent random variables. It's just the product of the expectation values of the two variables separately, if you know if you know what I'm saying in words. What you did basically is what they did. It's hard to state that in words, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah, I got it. And but I think it's the same result. Yeah, perhaps he, when the, the, the teacher mentions uh, this theorem for independent, not for expectation of independent random variables, maybe he mentions in the in the video. I don't know. I don't really watch his videos anymore. I think that the book, the book is good enough to not watch the video. No, I'm, ta I'm talking about the solution. Oh, there's videos, lecture videos? I didn't know that. Yeah. I'll, talk, I'll just talk to you about the... Um, solution videos, but certainly in chapter five, which is called joint distributions, this is a topic that we'll just discuss. So. Yeah, actually, the, the last exercise, I it also uses joint distributions. So I, I, I really wasn't able to solve it fully. I, I was hoping that we can uh, finish that exercise. Ah, there's yeah. not much time, so I, I will start. Oh, okay. okay, sorry. So, Okay, so that was it. item C, then item, sorry, item B, item C, uh, we want to minimize, so you have a random variable, okay, so it has already been fixed, so its expectancy and its variance is also fixed, but now we want to minimize using some constant, sorry, so, some variable, deterministic variable, uh, theta, 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 uh, this expectancy. So in, in this, in this expression, theta is working as a, as a number, just a one dimensional variable. So now for this function, we want to minimize, well, we want to minimize it. So as we spread out this exponent, uh, we get the equation for a parabola. So we know that because the term for the, for the, the squared, the square thing is the square variable is negative, the parabola is upside down. So the minimum would be at the point where the derivative vanishes. So we simply do that. And such constant that minimizes this error for this expectancy happens to be the, the expectancy of the random variable. So I don't know, maybe it's something interesting mathematically. Well, it comes up in, uh, you know, minimize some of the squares, right? So, yeah, the best the best estimator of the mean type thing, right? The best estimator of a very standard or how's it, I'm trying to say that. Um, if you minimize the distance of theta from x right squared, then that's kind of somehow like the best estimate of x, which is in fact the mean, right? So. It's one way of like, it's similar to like doing a curve fit, but the, the simplest possible case, right? <laughs> Minimize the sum of squares. Okay. So I think that's why it's, they, they threw that in there. Um, okay, and, and now in the last item, it's really a, a generalization of what we did in the exercise six, item C. We are not only considering three uniform random variables with same states. Um, now we're considering any of them. Uh, really, it, the proof is the same. So I don't know, there's really no point yeah. to mention. So now to, to, to get along with the exercise that I, would, that I wish to discuss, the next one was 
Uh, the next one was actually a thousand ten. I think from what, what I published in the FLAC forum. But then I realized that I think for each one of these items, the, and the actual proof is already in the book. So I don't want to write it. It's already over there. Now, well, this was actually interesting. I was trying to make it interactive uh, with observable, but I don't know, I didn't go the time. So uh, we got we have a Poisson model. We are using a random variable x to table the number of orders to be processes. Uh, this is in a restaurant setting. Um, such variable has a distribution Poisson with parameters alpha, where, para, where alpha is lambda, that is the average number of orders per day in the restaurant. N is the number of employees in the restaurant, um, mu. Is the number of orders that an employee can process per day. So they ask us to calculate if you fix lambda and mu, they want to find to find the smallest n that is the, the smallest number of employees, so that the probability that the probability that more than four orders are waiting is less than ten percent. Uh, well, I I try to do this uh, well, with general lambda and mu. But I, I know it, I think it's fully numeric, like there is no uh, a nice pattern about it. So I was yeah, simply, I came to the same conclusion when I did it as well. Yeah, so I simply did the case that they tell us, right? Lambda five, mu one, and you can iterate it with, with R um, for N B, the, the number of employees, you get that the smallest is three. Over here, the probability that there, are only, that there are more than four orders missing, it's only 3%. Uh, another actually interesting uh, problem, but I didn't get to solve it. It's a for thing. So it says, let the X be the number of photons counted by a receiver in an optical communication system. It is known that X is a Poisson random variable with a rate lambda one when a signal is present and a Poisson random variable with a rate lambda sub zero that is smaller than lambda one in the, uh, uh, but such is a distribution when a signal is absent. Uh, the probability that the signal is present is P. Uh, now, we want to, the, no, suppose what we observe x equals to the k photons, we want to determine a threshold t such that if k is smaller or greater than, sorry, is equal or greater than t, so that we can claim that the signal is present, and if such, and if such, if such threshold is greater than k, that is a number of photons counted, then that we then that we can claim that the signal is absent. So what is that thread? What is that threshold? Uh, the, the only thing that I got to to advance in this problem is uh, well, we define the the, the values, the parameters, uh, and the event that the, that the signal is present. And now we can use the I think it was called total probability theorem. So that the probability that k photons are counted. We can consider that event uh, via if the case is the signal is present, as we can see in this first term. And in the case if the signal is not present, that we can see over here. So via doing this sum, we get the PMS for the respective Poisson distributions. So now we can actually calculate the expected value of the number of photons counted. And because it is a linear operator, we like it works out nicely that the expected value is like a, an average of the, of the expected values when you consider the, the distribution of x, like case by case. In this case, the cases are if the signal is present or not. Uh, and that is, I don't know what else to, to find that. Right. 
Did anyone get to solve the, the problem? Yeah, I mean, you're really, I did solve it um, and you're really close, right? You just want, basically you just want to show when the uh, first part of your equation there is greater than the second part of your equation. And then you, right, because you have to make some assumption. What does he mean with the, uh, uh, what does he say exactly? He says, when can we claim that the signal is present, right? So there's some threshold T, uh, at that threshold T, those two probabilities are the same. Um, it's, it's how I did it anyway. And it does match the video solution when I looked at what they did, that's how they did it too. So it's basically a matter of, a matter of matching those two probabilities. Right, the two possibilities balance at that point. Uh, do you mean these probabilities? So, uh, no, the two, well, I'm not sure what those things are there, but the thing above that, you have that sum p times, yeah, those two things right there are the same, right? Because one of them represents probably that there's a, uh, of that there's a. Excuse me one second. I'm trying to deal with my dog here at the same time. <laughs> I'm carrying my laptop one-handed while talking to you and dealing with the, my my pet there. Um, hang on a second. Let's go back in my spot here. I don't know something like this, like inspecting uh, this yeah. inequality. Yeah, that's exactly what you, you end up doing. And then you um, solve that inequality for T, well, for K, right? And that gives you what, not, not minimize, just find K, right? Just find the K, solve that for K, right? You still get an inequality and that inequality tells you what T has to be. That's how I did it. Kind of, sort of how they did it somewhat like that, except, um, no, that's basically what they did too, I think. Mm -hmm. Basically, you want to solve the, you want to find the threshold where the probably the signal when, uh, probably, I'm sorry, probably of a signal, right, when K equals T is larger than the probability of no signal when K equals T. That's the kind of the, the logic, and that's what you wrote there. Right. But the it's exactly what you did. You did use those can you reverse that conditional probability and everything else is fine, but so I'm having a hard time uh being clear today for some reason. <laughs> I don't know why. Harder than usual. Mm -hmm, but I, I can't believe you're doing this in so well in uh, in public, so to speak. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> we had this, right? This one. I know because this is greater than one. And it is getting also greater than one when it is being exponent, but this is negative. So I don't know. I think I might have. You left out something. Yeah, you left out the exponential. Um, e the lambda zero minus. Mm. You left out the exponential up there. Uh, but but I, I I use it right. I use that. The. Uh, Sorry, that the, the difference is positive, then we expand exponentiate them. And I have this. And then I gave you the form for this initial inequality that you mentioned. So I have like one over p minus one more than 
But we assume that we're a smaller this. Um, I don't know. It's hard to do ma the math in public, but I mean, you're doing the right idea. Uh, I can share my screen and show you what I did if you want. Yeah. Real quickly here. Is this it? Yeah. So, so here is the, I'm basically doing the same thing. Um, can you see at the bottom here? Exercise 14. Yes. So uh, the probability of the signal, probably that um, there is a signal given a certain number of photons K, right? It's given by this expression, which you also worked out. And we really just want to choose the threshold so that the probability that there was a signal, right? Given the number of photons we observed is larger than the probability there is no signal. Uh, given the number of photons observed. That was my interpretation of what they're saying um, in the problem. And it seems to match what you're did, what the uh, TA did in the video solution. And so you just worked out, and this is exactly what you wrote down. It's the same equation you wrote down, except I have T, I already put T in there um, instead of K, but you just, just solve the inequality, right? So that's all this is, right? So you just, in your equation, what you were right now, you left out somehow this part. I mean, I can't highlight it probably, but this part, this exponential, you dropped it by accident. Um, but then you, you know, press on through, get that T out of there, take the log, blah, blah, blah. And this is this messy equation you get. Doesn't seem to have any um, particularly elegant result, but that's basically how. Um, I was considering on the probability of K giving the signal. I had to do it the other way around. But do they actually use the fact that lambda sub zero is smaller than lambda sub one? Yes, it's in the problem. Yeah. Um, oh, do they use it? Um, do I need that here? I don't think I do need that. Do I? Uh, you maybe one of these inequalities would flip around if it wasn't the case. What you're saying, right? I forgot. I, I did this so long ago now, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, you do need to use that. Otherwise, the, the inequality would flip around. We take the log here. That's where it becomes important, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's, it's important that lambda one is bigger than lambda zero. Anyway, so that's how I approached it. I don't know if that helps at all. <laughs> Okay, thanks. Uh, well, yeah, now, that was the last exercise, so I know what if there is anything more. By the way, you did a really great job with these exercises. I love the way you presented these with the um, with that whatever that software you're using there to do the drawing on the screen and the, uh, it's beautiful it, stuff. It with Porto actually using ah. the reveal slides, something like that. Very cool. Do you have a uh, a tablet, or are you, were you drawing with the mouse? Uh, no, I have a tablet, but my okay. letter is pretty early. <laughs> All right. Yeah, really good and thorough job. I really appreciate yeah. that. Yeah, uh, I think I'm probably going to end up uh, watching this meeting again. <laughs> so very helpful. Um, all right, so next week we have uh, the next chapter, which is, uh, I mentioned it in the chat. Um, is it continuous? Um, blah, 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 blah. Continuous random variables. Um, and uh, Lucio said that he can start that. So uh, great. <laughs> so we'll be back next week for that. Awesome. All right. I will see you all then. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much, Lucio.